Welcome to Because the Beatles, the podcast about the Beatles, everything about the Beatles 24-8. I'm Allison. And I'm Erica. And before we start, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts or stream us on Spotify. And if you're enjoying BC the Beatles, feel free to leave us a preferably five-star review so other Beatle maniacs can find us. That's right. And also don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok or YouTube. We'll be posting videos, photos, and more from this episode and beyond. And you can also email us at bcthebeatles at gmail.com. And we're so excited about today's. I mean, we say that every week. We're always excited about the show, but we're having one of our very good friends on that we have hung out with at conferences. And he is just a delight. And we have a really fun conversation coming up for you guys. Yes, we absolutely love running into him at Beatles events. Richard is a professor and a Beatles scholar who published an incredible book called The Beatles and Fandom, Sex, Death, and Progressive Nostalgia. And with the 60th anniversary of The Beatles and Ed Sullivan just around the corner, Richard joins us today to talk about the weird and wonderful world of Beatles fandom. So a little bit about Richard. Dr. Richard Mills is an associate professor in English and popular culture at St. Mary's University, London. He's been the program director for the film and popular culture cultural studies, and Irish studies degrees. He's published extensively on popular music, Irish literature and culture, film, fashion, and British television. His book, The Beatles and Fandom, Sex, Death, and Progressive Nostalgia, was published in 2019. He's also the co-editor of Mad Dogs and Englishness and is the author of the forthcoming The Beatles and Black Music, Post-Colonial Theory, Musicology, and Remix Culture, coming later this year as well as last year's The Beatles and Humor. Richard is a regular contributor to BBC Four's Last Word, Sky News, RTE, Portobello Radio, and BBC Live. He's also on the editorial board of the Journal of Beatles Studies. So let's welcome Richard Mills. Hi, Richard. The last time I saw you both together was New Jersey with Miss Thomas and Art Lewison. Yes, that wonderful white album symposium. That was so much fun. It's like a storied conference. People who haven't been there have talked to me about it. It's like, I can't believe you were there. I've heard so much about that white album conference. It's got its own mythology now, I think. It does. Yeah, that was pretty crazy. So, Richard, you're a professor and an author focusing on literature and popular culture and, of course, a Beatles fan. What inspired you to write this book on the Beatles and fandom? The main reason I wrote a book on Beatles fans, I, I did see a little bit of a gap in the market back about 2017, 2018. I wanted to do two things. I wanted to really explore the Beatles phenomenon and go, why were people so obsessed with the Beatles? I was going to do that very subjectively through the lens of me. And I came to all sorts of sort of weird conclusions about why people get obsessed with the Beatles. I mean, one of them is uh, the ubiquity of the Beatles. It's just everywhere. I mean, one of my earliest childhood memories is perhaps even the earliest is just walking around the house when I was two, three years old and hearing my brother sing Ticket to Ride very badly. So already my mind was colonized by Beatles before I could almost do anything about it. So just that, the fact that the Beatles are disseminated everywhere is one reason, I think, as well. I mean, just look, I'm sitting in London. Just think of the British national mythologies completely. The national narrative is absolutely wedded to the story of the Beatles. I mean, when North American tourists come to America, they go to three places. They go to Shakespeare's Globe, Buckingham Palace, and very often they go to Abbey Road first. And I mean, that was another reason I got really into this fandom aspect of the Beatles. I used to go on Beatles walks and I used to go to Abbey Road and eventually I handed out questionnaires. I interviewed people um, at Abbey Road and I just found the most fantastic and strange and exhilarating stories. So the deeper I looked into this, I realized a, a great idea for a book. The first chapter I got into was what I called biographers and journalists writing about the Beatles. People like Philip Norman, shall we mention Philip Norman, uh, Mark sure. Ripson, Ian McDonald, people like that. And in many ways, it was really quite subjective, partial, biased, if you like, when they wrote about the Beatles. So I was looking at these sort of biographers as sort of fans, in a sense, as super fans, as really subjective in their writing. It really wasn't a very objective and partial truth. And that really attracted me to the biographers and journalists. I mean, Ian McDonald's book, especially is a very subjective piece of writing and 
He's incredibly opinionated. He says he doesn't like Here Comes the Sun. He offers these opinions up, which I think is fantastic. So a seemingly objective journalist, and journalists are supposed to be objective, just to hear them to write like fans. That was the initial impetus from our search, just to look at famous Beatles writers and see that they were very partial and very subjective and very opinionated. That was really interesting, especially because you juxtaposed it with the idea of fan fiction and Slash and how, in some ways, there's kind of a muddy line between fact and fiction in, in both of these things, that the Beatles authors are very subjective, whereas the fiction writers might be extremely fact-based in the way they situate their stories. Erica, that's one of the best questions I've ever, ever been asked. I think it's, it's really, <laughs> no, seriously, it's very, very important. I mean, if you read a piece of biography or a piece of history, it's very often subjective. I mean, there's, I'll, I'll give you an example from my, when I had my previous hat on and I used to write about Irish literature. There was an Irish writer called John McGarren, a really great Irish novelist. And he wrote a novel called The Barracks, which was based on his life growing up in a Garda Shikana station, that's the Irish place in Ireland. And it was fiction, but it was completely and utterly made up truth. It was completely almost biographical. And then he wrote a memoir, which he it just inherited, you know, fiction, really. There was bits in it that didn't happen. He imagined meeting his mother in a dream and walking around this field. And it was all made up. So that's such a good question. Someone like Ian McDonald, he goes for the emotional warmth of being a Beatles fan. He goes for lyrical, poetic, mellifluous writing. He doesn't necessarily have to get everything right. He's conveying a feeling. And other writers who just collect dry facts, one, they could be erroneous. Two, people's memories are completely fallible. I mean, I could go around the world and interview everybody that had anything to do with the Beatles, but it's very partial. Their memories are very, very fallible. So sometimes it's amazing to take a deep dive into slash fiction, Beatles literary fiction, Beatles fan fiction. And sometimes you find the truth in fiction. It's very, very strange that that, that happens. You talk about fallible memories, Richard, too. I think it's really funny when Paul and Ringo talk. I feel like their memories are kind of the most fallible. You know, there are a lot of scholars that might know their career better than they do, because I think, you know, they've told the same rote stories for decades so if they have a picture in their mind of what happened, it kind of gets embedded, but it's not necessarily what actually happened. Yeah, it's like Paul and Ringo with memories of memories. Mm. Right. It's like playing telephone with themselves. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's very true. I mean, there's different approaches to writing a book about the Beatles. Ian McDonald famously is very cavalier, very subjective. He gets all the facts right about who was in the studio, who played which instrument, but it really does seem very close to new journalism, where someone like Mark Lewis and just collates information, just like this archive, like a library, he just finds out the most unbelievable stuff. So there's a couple of ways about going about it. And I mean, I'm quite a whimsical character, as you can hear from talking to me. I absolutely love fan fiction and just being really iconoclastic, being very whimsical, but very capricious with the Beatles mythology, because quite often that's what it is. It's mythology. It is memories of memories. The truth is, I mean, it's a long time since the last time the Beatles recorded music and anger was, um, all four of them was probably August 1969. So it's really retreating into that vanishing point. And it's, mm -hmm. you've got to be very aware of historical method when you approach this cultural phenomenon, because we have to be aware that we're not always accessing the truth. I think some of these books have been almost dangerous if you look at Shout. And the reputation that Paul McCartney versus John Lennon had in, in the collective consciousness after that was accepted as truth. It's unbelievable because I'm a second generation Beatles fan. I was talking to Ken Womack about this. I think we both got into the Beatles with the, the Red and the Blue albums the first time around in 1973. So I sort of lived through this. And at points in my life, I completely imbibed and believed the propaganda. So when Shout came out in 1981, not long after John Lennon had been murdered. I completely, for a period of years, believed, oh, John Lennon was the great one in the Beatles. The rest of the Beatles really didn't do anything. John Lennon was the errant, wonderful genius and all because Philip Norman had just, again, very subjectively, in a very partial, biased way, had argued this. And then a few years later, I realized this is nonsense, especially 
when a McDonald came out with Revolution in the Head, the Beatles records in the 60s. When that, when that first edition came out, I think in 95, I think it was, he suddenly addressed, as he called it, the shallow media bias against Paul McCartney. And I read that and went, this guy is right to address this, this John Lennon mythology that Lennon's completely deified. And again, Philip Norman also you know, very famously wrote a really quite scathing obituary of George Harrison after he died. And I've just finished reading Philip Norman's biography of George Harrison, and he's completely reversed his opinions. And it's actually, I have to say, because Philip Norman originally was a novelist, so he's got a really beautiful style. I think his book about George Harrison's quite fair, but he's completely changed his opinion. Same when Norman did his biography of Paul McCartney, because very famously in Shout in 1981, he, he just characterized McCartney as a, a mixture of some sort of saccharine, sort of sweetie marshmallow compared with a sort of, you know, a really Machiavellian, pushy sort of character with, and Lennon had the real talent. And then by the time he gets around to his uh, apology, it's a biography of McCartney that came out a few years ago, and he's completely reversed his position. So I don't know. I know Philip Norman does seem to be very unpopular in the, the Beatles universe, but, you know, in a way, that unpredictability, that willing to contradict himself, there's a strange sort of twisted honesty to that. In in a way, if if you see what I mean. Yeah. Well, once these stereotypes, like you just described with Philip Norman, get out into the, you know, the zeitgeist, it's very hard to put that genie back in the bottle. Absolutely, it is. I mean, I feel sometimes when I just look at the sort of godlike genius of Paul McCartney, I just think the phrase, a prophet doesn't have honour in his own country, seems to pop into my head quite often. That's changed in the last five or six years, actually. He's got so much respect in the uh, Mm -hmm. UK now. but. Through most of my adult life, it was just open season on Paul McCartney. When he released an album, it was just fair game to have a go at him. And the main reason for that was star theory. He just didn't do a James Dean or a Marilyn Monroe or, you know, a a John Lennon and die young. That was the only reason that he was so vilified and criticised in the press. Again, being a man of a certain age, I'm not going to say my age on the podcast, but you can Google me and find out. Um, I remember in 78, 79, for Lennon made his comeback and Lennon was assassinated. 78, 79, my friends and I, we just, we loved Paul McCartney and thought he was very, very cool. Even releasing Malif Kintar, it just seemed to be after Lennon died, it suddenly the press just jumped in this bandwagon and just took sides. And it was really, really unhelpful and really shallow, actually. Yeah, sure. And once you're Paul, what can you do? You're fighting against this image of John as deity. I remember this program called 48 Hours with Paul McCartney. It was a news program about the 8990 tour. So they followed him backstage and they were talking to him. And the reporter asked him a question about this issue about John being deified. And he just seemed so uncomfortable. He didn't know how to deal with it. He's like, I can't even talk about it. It's unseemly. And he was just backed into that corner. Yeah, I mean, this is his one of his best friends. And it's just incredible to think of it like that. He must be in a very, very strange position to be categorized as just not as edgy and creative as John Lennon. And it's just, it's just not true. Look at Paul's solo career. Oh, There's lots of really experimental moments in that. There's the McCartney 2 album from 1980. It's essentially dance music. There's, you know, the classical music. There's, I mean, there's all sorts. He's debatably the most avant-garde Beatle. Yes, it, it does come out a little bit in a lot of the, the sort of received wisdom about the Beatles. Uh, John was in the stockbroker belt in Weybridge and was a little bit, before he met Yoko, he was a little bit um, just drifting a little bit in life. He didn't have much of a direction. While Paul was going to galleries and listening to Stockhausen and Berio and hanging out with William Burroughs and doing all this stuff. And, and, and that's quite true. It was really interesting to me in the in the book that you spent time on the fact that Beatles historians are often fans first. And mm-hmm. I'm wondering, how do you think that influences just scholarship on a more macro level compared to historians that are war historians or things that are less personal to them? That's very interesting. I do think that nearly every writer about the Beatles has got their own ideology that they foist onto this cultural phenomenon. I'm thinking about, there was a Marxist historian called David Fowler wrote a book about youth culture in the 1960s. 
And he said absolutely definitively that Beatles did not represent the counterculture or youth culture in the 1960s. They were out of touch. They were the new left in England hated them. And the real authentic, in inverted commas, youth culture of the 1960s was the mods. And then you read Ian McDonald goes in the period 67 to 68, the Beatles absolutely embodied the 1960s counterculture. And it's just someone has a, a point of view, um, an ideology, and they just voice that onto the band, whether that's a, a Marxist take on it or whether that's a, a right wing take on the Beatles as well. The left and the right take very strong positions on the Beatles and the 1960s. And again, it completely depends on their ideology. As, as usual, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle in some sort of liminal space, I would pause it. Yeah. And Richard, I really want to touch on something else in your book that really struck me, which is that you really didn't shy away from this idea of Beatles fans and mental illness, for lack yes. of a better term. And something <laughs> that I found unique about your book is that you didn't you talked kind of at great lengths about John Lennon's murderer and the man who attacked George Harrison. They come up several times. I was very reluctant to do that chapter actually, but mm -hmm. I thought I had to because there's a debate in fandom studies that Mark Chapman wasn't a Beatles fan. And he was just, you know, mm -hmm. categorized by the press as a little not a crazy Beatles fan. And in many ways he's not typical of a, of a fan. Say Mark Chapman's personality is spokes on a wheel. Like all of us, our personalities are all wheels with lots of different little spokes that make up our character. One of those spokes was an okay Beatles fan. He wasn't, he wasn't completely obsessed with the Beatles, maybe to the last year or two of his life. I mean, famously as hero was Todd Rundgren. So, you know, just the press, I think, were quite unhelpful and just said that this is a um, deranged fan. So that was the mm. big debate in fan studies. So I thought, just couldn't not address that. And also, I wanted to look at the dark side of fandom as well. Like, what's the old cliche? Be careful what you wish for, it might come true. I just think of John Lennon's life. You know, he, he died young because of his super fame. And George, you know, was stabbed dozens of times in his own, own home. I just thought, I really wouldn't be doing my job as a writer if I didn't drill down into the dark side of fandom. It's interesting as well, because you do talk about slash fiction. It's highly sexualized. It's highly eroticized. It's whimsical. It's crazy. But that's something else. That's more, that's sort of, um, there's a good feeling at the heart of that. There's joy at the heart of that. It's sort of like the early Beatles. Barbara Ehrenreich in her book, Dancing in the Streets, talks about how feminist the, the Beatles fans were. The young demographic could really let go. In the 1950s in America, the lid was on. Young girls, their heroes were people like Elvis Presley and Marlon Brando and these macho people. The high school jocks had shaved heads and buzz cuts. And then suddenly you get these strange androgynous figures from Europe who are quite wacky, you know, like most rock stars, a little bit, you know, as I said, androgynous. So this was just a really nice, warm feeling of liberation. Whereas the dark side of fandom is completely the opposite. It's isolated people who've sort of given in to mental health problems, to put it very mildly. And Michael Abram, who attacked George Harrison, had all sorts of hallucinations about the Beatles were witches and warlocks and were sending him messages. Mark Chapman was hallucinating that little people lived in his cell, were telling him what to do. Um, he eventually confessed to the murder of John Lennon because God told him to confess. These people just represented a really dark side of fandom and in inverted commas, if it actually was fandom. So I thought I really had to, as I said, drill down deep into that. Yeah, definitely. It was really interesting to read. Let's go back because, you know, we've been kind of dancing around fan fiction, this whole conversation so far, but like, let's, you know, let's dive into it. So Richard, I gotta say, I noticed that you didn't mention what is the most epic Beatles fan fiction ever written <laughs> called Into My Into My Life. Yeah. It is amazing. I don't Aww. know if you're familiar with it. If you're not, I will send you a link because it is thought of in the, as somebody who used to write fan fiction myself. I've written it as well, actually. Yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> and and for the record, I used a lot of like Mark Lewison's like recording the Beatles book, like the ones that just sort of listed the dates and what they did. I used a lot of those for my fanfic, so hey. 
Um, but this is widely respected and regarded in the fan fiction community as the cream of the crop. And we will link it in our show notes. It's so good. It's so good. Anyway, you need to read that if you haven't. I haven't read this either. Oh, it's so good. I've got to apologize profusely for that. I knew I was gonna, <laughs> I was gonna leave something out. I wanted to shoehorn in Kevin Barry because I love him. I wanted to, you know, his Beetlebum book. That's the literary side of fan fiction. I wanted to shoehorn in in the clouds book Snodgrass. And I did look at quite a lot of fan slash fiction as well, but that I absolutely admit that was that was an oversight. When you emailed me earlier today, I had a quick little look at it, and I was re- I was reading it before we started to record this. Okay, good. It's, good. Re- it's really, really good. It's so good. Maybe the second edition of my book, I can put that in. Yes, please, please. And going off of that, one thing that I've always been amazed by is that there's kind of an inherent sexism in fan fiction where women writing it, you know, it's cutesy. It's even if it's very well written like mm-hmm. Diana's Into My Life, but it's, you know, it's cutesy, it's trite. It's about women who just want to fuck the Beatles, you know, but if men mm-hmm. write it, you know, you just named works by men that are regarded as literary fiction or historical fiction. Why do you think that it is? It seems unfair to me. It's just literary snobbery that dismisses these young slash fiction writers. I mean, I really quite serious about this because I read through an awful lot of slash fiction and fan fiction. And it's incredibly well written. It's incredibly um, imaginative. It's carnivalesque. It's whimsical. It's pushing the envelope. It does all the things that good fiction should do. It's just it's not in a major publisher. It hasn't got that you know epithet and inverted commas of literary. And I mean, I wonder if I should say this on a podcast. I mean, I went through a stage when I was rather pretentious, and I would read Booker Prize winners. I don't think there's ever been a good Booker Prize winner book because it's just a tone and it's always a political decision. Whereas there's so much great creativity in fiction, which is completely outside the literary canon. And that was one of the reasons that I wrote that chapter. I mean, I've got a book in front of me now called Across the Universe, Tales of Alternative Beatles. And it was edited by Michael Bontrelli and Randy Dawn. And I hope that's a real name. It's a great name. They're absolutely incredible. And it, this one is, admittedly, it is published. I think it's quite a minor publisher. But I absolutely think that slash fiction, fan fiction, at its best, is up there with any form of writing. Absolutely it is. I think a lot of people would agree with you. I just love the, the iconoclasm of it. I and mean, there's one slash story that I can't remember the title, but John's getting it on with Brian Epstein. George is about to join in. I don't know what Ringo's doing. Paul's getting involved. And it's just, it's <laughs> all this holy sacred shrine of Abbey Road. The Beatles are essentially having this great big gay orgy in the middle of Abbey Road. And I'm just going, I love it. This is fantastic. Because it, it is, it's like putting a moustache on the Mona Lisa to promulgate the cliche. Because there's just, sometimes there's a little bit too much respect about the mythology and the history. And as you know, history needs to be deconstructed because historians, biographers, journalists, they so often get things wrong. So why not take a dive into the the whimsical and the sexual and the crazy. It captures what the Beatles were all about. Can you imagine if John Lennon had lived? He would have gone, I love this slash fiction. It's like, in his own right, it's like I'm a Spaniard in the works. His wordplay, his Joycey in wordplay, his neologisms, his good sort of writing, his surreal writing. You know, absolutely, he would have, I, well, who can take what he would have thought. But I think it would have tickled his fancy. Oh, I can absolutely see John having an account on those sites. And every once in a while, he'd be stealthily commenting on them as well and joining the community. I don't know, guys. I kind of disagree. Really? Uh, I, think... I know. I was just, I got, I got a bit excited there. Yeah. Sorry, Richard. Yeah, I mean, I, having known certain artists who have had slash fiction written about them, I know how they reacted and they don't love it. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I, I could be wrong. I don't know. You've reminded me of a very funny story. One of my students years ago wrote a story about me and some Beatles dolls. I won't say what happened, but uh, the, the, the wow. Beatles dolls did sort of seem <laughs> to disappear into a part of my anatomy below the waist. And I, I wasn't particularly flattered by that story, I have to say. Oh, my God. That's crazy. You know, that's a funny thing about Beatles fanfic, though. Like, if you're writing fanfic about, I don't know, Doctor Who or Sherlock or Harry Potter, they're not real. 
But this is a whole fanfic genre that yeah. is based around people who are, you know, alive or yeah. more alive or living now. That's the problem because I think a lot of the times the line gets blurred between slash fan fiction and what really happened. I am not a slash person. I, I don't yuck anybody's yum. If you love it, that is awesome. <laughs> you do you. But it's like, I think people who die on the hill of McLennan where John and Paul had this big gay affair, mm -hmm. believe it if you want to, but I don't know if anybody can prove it's canon. So, you know, I think that's kind of a danger, but I guess it's danger of any fiction yeah. based on history. Mm -hmm. no, you make such a, you both make such an interesting point because obviously I think from my research for the book, I think I'm probably right about this. I think the origins of slash fiction, as far as I know, is Star Trek. The original series, people wrote highly eroticized fiction about Spock and James T. Kirk in a relationship. And I think it came from there. And as you say, like Sherlock, et cetera, et cetera, these are fictional characters. So maybe, yeah, that maybe that's the, the demarcation there. I'm not sure. John Locke? Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> Crickets. No, I know it's what you mean. Watson and Sherlock. Okay, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> it's been a while. Sherlock was canceled so long ago. <laughs> it's been such a long time. I can't even get into Sherlock. We don't even have time for me to talk about Sherlock. But, you know, going off of this, it's perfect time to talk about something else. It's a big component of your book and something that you say is really intrinsic to the Beatles fandom, which is sexuality. And I really like how you addressed it kind of throughout. You weaved it throughout all the topics because it's I feel like it's a really taboo subject to talk about in fandom it can seem very like genderized but it is at the heart of fandom in a lot of ways it absolutely is there's no doubt about that there's been great work done on this by barbara ehrenreich's dancing in the streets and christine Feldman barrett's woman's history of the beatles the subtitle of your book of course it mentions sex and then it calls out two other extremely provocative topics which is death and progressive nostalgia I felt like death was a really important part of your book. And it, it also, like sex, kind of weaved its way through all of your narrative. Can you talk a little bit about how you view the ideas of death and grieving in the context of the Beatles fandom? Absolutely, I could. I think that, first of all, called psychology. I mean, Thanatos and Eros, love and death, the love drive and the death drive, I think, is absolutely central to understanding the Beatles. And in, in many ways, the Beatles have outstared mortality in a sense. Just look at the AI with um, now and then, because you've got all duetting with his old friend John at Glastonbury. You've got, you know, free as a bird, real love. These sort of specters resonate to us from the past. They're just there because of technology. This grieving, this melancholy, it actually imbues new Beatle texts with so much melancholy and so much. And just so much depth. I mean, just to hear this weird, disembodied John Lennon voice from beyond the grave, it's it's very, very emotional and very, very affecting. It's it's absolutely incredible. So and also the sort of death with his scythe is there absolutely at the center of the Beatles story. And look, I mean, look, unfortunately, look what happened to John and George being attacked. And I mean, just think about again the woman's influence on the Beatles, John and Paul losing their mothers at a very early age, that really, according to George Martin, that really drove them on to be really experimental, wacky, to walk along the tightrope without any netting. They really wanted to go and make mm. their lives and put themselves on the map. So Thanatos and Eros, I think, are absolutely central to the Beatles story. Um, sex, obviously, is there. Death, as I've just said, was there as well. And this idea of progressive nostalgia also feeds into the technology as well, because in many ways, you go far back with the Beatles to move far forward. I mean, a great example of this is the Beatles' White Album that came out on the 22nd of November, 1968. And then Jay-Z's The Black Album came out in 2003. And Danger Mouse comes and mashes them both together and creates an entirely new text out of all music now. The Beatles songs are amazing. They'll be around for hundreds of years, probably, and we'll be singing them and whistling them and humming them. But it doesn't do the Beatles phenomenon. It doesn't do their music any harm. Give it a bit of a reboot. Give it a bit of a retread. Mash it up, whether that's videos, whether that's songs, whether that's the Beatles themselves indulging in progressive nostalgia, because that's exactly what Now and Then is. 
That's McCartney and Ringo indulging in progressive nostalgia. They're going far back, but they're also creating something new. And that's all down to technology. I mean, I teach a course in the Beatles at um, St. Mary's University in Twickenham. And one of the things I said in my class today was, look, if we were doing a class on 19th century romanticism and, you know, um, Shelley and all the romantic poets, you can't get on YouTube and watch them. You can't see interviews with them. There's this just strange, busying archive that is everywhere that we can access 24-7 and find out what was going on with the Beatles. And then we can access this archive and morph it and transform it into something, something new. And sometimes I think that maybe Beatles fans are a little bit conservative and don't like us putting moustaches on the, the Mona Lisa, but I think that's absolutely in the spirit of the Beatles. I mean, they were um, John's art school. They were creative, innovative people. They're always looking for the next, the next thing. I mean, really, their career was only six years, and they moved from Love Me to, to Revolution Number no. 9 in a couple of years. Tomorrow Never Knows and Love Me Do are separated by three years. So I think um, being radical, embracing the new of the Beatles is just something that fans do, and it's entirely in the spirit of Beatles, I think. It's so interesting how all through the Beatles' careers and through the 60-plus years of fandom, this awareness of time and looking back but you know even paul mccartney in the world tonight i go back so far i'm in front of me and so you know, yeah. his biography was called many years from now it's you know it's just this running theme to look back you know mark lewis and tune in all these years we're so fixated as the fandom on looking at it through this lens i think also erica a really interesting point to this death topic you brought up is we have to remember a lot of next gen fans like myself. I wasn't born yet when John was killed. So that's always been a really intrinsic part of my fandom. And I know, you know, a lot of the younger fans, they weren't alive when George was attacked or when he passed away. So it's kind of like an ever present part of the fandom in that way. Would you say an ever present past? <laughs> I was going to, but then I didn't. <laughs> no, it's, it's absolutely right. It's got this. Um... Not to be macabre about it. No, it's it's not. It just, it's like all art. It, knowing the biography of the people that make the art does add a lot of emotion to these songs. I mean, if you know what, I mean, all Beatles fans, you know, are in tears when they listen to Julia about John losing his mum mm. at 17. Everybody loves Let It Be because, you know, Paul's essentially singing it to Mary Mohan, his, his mother. That's what great art is about. It inherits this, this Thanatos and this Eros. Yeah. It, it's, it's, I'm going to cry in a second. Um, so ask me a more frivolous question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we have those too. And we do. <laughs> I, I, I can't bet you do. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about tribute bands. That's another really oh interesting topic that you touch on. And that's a, that, looking at that as an objective observer, that's a weird section of the fandom. It's not quite musical theater. It's not quite imitation. It's creative, but it's, it's you know, it's imitation. It's just very strange. It's people impersonating real people. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I, I would, I'm jokingly going to say that Paul McCartney is a Beatles tribute act. See, most of his set, <laughs> three quarters of his set, is Beatles songs, but I've just been a bit facetious and a bit, a bit. What about Ringo? Glib. Yeah, 100% of his set. Is, no, that's not true. Um, <laughs> and that's true. I suppose that's true a little bit as well. I, I think it absolutely is because, you know, as you said, Paul and Ringo are just so aware of the this legacy. You know, they've had to carry that weight as, you know, just, just to name check a Beatles song. It's, it, it's absolutely true. Um, Erica, what you said about Beatles tribute acts, I mean, for once I'm almost sort of lost for words. You know how garrulous I am, but I'm sort of a bit lost for words because, I mean, the, the sheer diversity of Beatles tribute acts absolutely gives me vertigo. It's dizzying. I mean, it's absolutely <laughs> remarkable. I've seen experimental jazz Beatles groups. I've seen young Spanish 20-something women doing, called Funkles, doing soul versions of Beatles songs. I've seen the bootleg Beatles. The Analogues, the Dutch tribute band, did the whole White Album at the London Palladium. Anything you can name, there's a tribute band that do that style of music. Also, every country in the world, let's go to art, let's jump on a plane to Argentina. There you've got your Beatles. Tribute bands. Let's go to Brazil. You've got your Beatles tribute bands all over the world. It's not just the 
Anglosphere, it's not just Anglo-American individualism. This culture has just seemed to permeate in almost everywhere. It's very, very, very strange. And, you know, and dressing up as your heroes, that's not exactly what they all do. Occasionally, when I first saw Beats for Big Bands, when I wrote that chapter, I was absolutely prepared to ridicule these bands. I just thought this is an absolute joke. People in stupid wigs and stupid suits, you know, and people, you know, like, you know, you know, when you see an Elvis impersonator, they never do the young, good looking Elvis. They always do like the 1977 Elvis. It's some old guy or something who drives a taxi, (laughs) right? So, so the thing is, this thing is that it just, oh, I'm lost for words, Erica. I mean, I, uh, so full disclosure, I, so I work in music, as you guys both know. I know, know. yes. My, my, (laughs) <laughs> my first uh real like foray into working in music was working for a tribute band in northeast ohio called hard days night hey guys um <laughs> and that really it taught me a lot about you know because i did marketing for them i did their website at one point i used to do their photography it gave me the chops and live music but having been around tribute bands gosh i was probably around them for about 20 years but it's interesting the psyche of it I remember one time I was staying at a hotel. Uh, I had gone to see my friend's band out on Long Island. And I was staying at a hotel. And as I was walking out, the Paul opened the door. I didn't realize he was staying down the hall from me. And uh, Till There Was You was coming out of the room. And I'm like, really? <laughs> I'm like, you're really listening to this, like, on your off time? Um, so it's it's funny. And then there are people in these bands that sort of just take it as not a joke, but they're more, you know, like free flowing with it. So I think it's funny how much of a gamut, you know, the really dedicated impersonators run. Like some of them realize it's tongue in cheek and they have fun with it, but other people are really, really serious about it. Absolutely. It's but the standard of musicianship with tribute bands is incredible. I mean, if they mm-hmm. do just want to yeah. imitate Beatles, they can do it perfectly. I mean, I went to see what a tribute band called, I think it was the Hamburg Beatles. And they just did all the songs that Beatles would have played in Hamburg. That's the best kind of tribute band. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they just were in leather and they were young and they just did a very, you know, these very punchy, aggressive songs. And I just couldn't imagine Beatles in Hamburg being any better than that. It was absolutely remarkable. They were probably better than the Beatles in Hamburg. It's really <laughs> funny. Yeah. Well, you can imagine if the Beatles did things like they played 45 nights in a row, six to eight hours or whatever it is, you know, that. The Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 R rule. If they had done that, they're going to have their off nights, aren't they? It's true. It is interesting, though, to think about these tribute bands because they're so, it's more than just a, a musical theater performance in the sense that they know the Beatles so well. And, and part of their excellence in what they do is being so keyed into the fandom and the little asides and the little mannerisms and all these things. And they give the fans this experience of being there, of being part yeah. of something that many of us could never have been part of. And yeah, that's so true. I just think that every performance every night is completely different depending on the audience. And one of my favorite stories a friend um, told me is that he went to see Beatles Tribute Act. They were all dressed as 1965 help Beatles with their foam military jackets. And in between, gap between songs, someone shouted, John, play Imagine. And he went. Oh, geez. Yeah, I haven't written it yet. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. The, the the unpredictability of a performance every night is just it's just so funny. And as you say, I mean, you know, especially when the Beatles got on the um, the treadmill of success. I mean, when I looked at that, what what was the, the film that Richie Cunningham directed? You know. Oh, eight days a week. Yeah, eight days a week. I mean, a lot of those. Um, yeah, sorry, sorry, Richie. A lot of the sound is very, very ropey when they're on stage, you know, at the height of their touring because they don't have the PAs, it's they can hardly hear each other. And I think all those cliches are quite true. It probably would have been better to see the Beatles in 62, 63 than maybe 65 and 66. It did mm. sort of rub the edge up a bit, I think. Um, Ron Hard, sorry, That's, his, his name's just come to me. I, I, remember, I remember loving that film, but thinking, they don't sound too great in a lot of those clips. Whereas if you go and see a tribute band, they've got it down to, you know, fine art. And, you know, for a lot of us next gen fans, you know, a tribute band might be the closest thing we'll ever get to seeing the Beatles. 
you know, other than seeing like Paula Ringo in concert, we're very lucky to have them still playing. So we focus a lot on the podcast about the next gen fan yeah. experience because we're both we're obviously not first generation fans. Yeah. One thing that I know you brought up in the book that I and I'm sure Erica and probably you too, Richard, have encountered our first generation fans saying, quote unquote, you're too young to know this music, you know, but Beatlemania is timeless. Um, however, you know, nostalgia does play into the next gen fan experience, don't you think? That sort of unfounded nostalgia for a time you never experienced. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. There's, I think I wrote somewhere in the book where I interviewed lots of millennials. They would do things like buy larva lamps and typewriters and have pen pals and obviously vinyl, which is coming back, but a few years ago it wasn't quite as popular again, just to really inhabit the 1960s. And also, yeah, you're right, nostalgic for, I think there's something with um, Erica, Allison, me, because we're not first generation fans. We do really sort of, in a way, romanticize this sort of this halcyon period that we'd never experienced in the first place. And in that way, we can foist all our sort of idealism and our imagination onto this period that it really wasn't as magical, maybe, as we make it out to be. Also, I do think that the advantage that second generation, third generation people's fans have over people that remember the phenomenon, first generation fans, is that we can approach this um, cultural phenomenon wholesale. We can just take a great big dive. You know, when you love a writer or you love um, a novelist or anything, you just go and read all their work. We can just, when my first came to Beatles, I went, oh my gosh, I can go back to Please Please Me and, you know, nerd fest my way right through the canon. And that's a beautiful thing to be able to do. Yeah, there's many entry points. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Obviously, the demographic for Beatles fandom is getting older, but I'm, I'm constantly surprised. I mean, I was chatting to about 30 students a year ago and I was asking them what music they liked and they were all into Ed Sheeran, Taylor Swift. And then one of them said, "My this 21-year-old said to me, my favourite song is something by the Beatles. Everywhere I go, this happens to me. So I don't know, it's, you know, Ed McDonald called the Beatles the people's music, folk music. That's maybe why it's got these legs, because it's folk music, it's people's music. It just seems to have got hold of us all for many, many reasons. And I think, you know, been very cyclical in this discussion. That's the reason I wanted to examine the, the Beatles phenomenon. Yeah, the music's great, but why did they become so successful? Why are people so obsessed with them? And I mean, it's endlessly fascinating to me. There's no one answer to that, but it yeah. is true that you look at the Beatles compared to other groups or acts that were extremely popular that made the girls faint in their day. I don't know anything from Elvis to New Kids on the Block to One Direction. They all feel to me much more situated in their time and place than the Beatles do. The Beatles feel more timeless, more universal in a way. I sort of agree with that. I can't imagine in 70 years time someone's going to write BTS and fandom. Ken Womack brings that out in one of his books as well. It, the, the Beatles reinvented themselves. That's the thing. When they went sort of psychedelic with Robert Soul, I mean, that, that was a risk that might not have paid off. Because they were creative and they experimented, they did morph and change. And then when you get such a big fan base, the fans are just going to appropriate what they want from the Beatles and just move it into directions that Brian Epstein, the Beatles, George Martin, the first generation fans couldn't even imagine. I do sound very sort of like an evangelist or something here, don't I? I think you're in the no, right place. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We're it's, true. it's all that coffee I had because it's quite late in London here, yeah. You know, I'm so curious, and this is off the topic of the book, but you said that you teach a class in the Beatles at university. What are the students like? What makes them decide they want to take this class? Are they fans to begin with? Do they just know something about the Beatles? Or do they want to be historians? It's all of those things, actually. Funny enough, it's called the Beatles and the Counterculture, and it's a, a level six, which is a third year course. And my class today, we're all born in 2003. So I've been oh working oh. longer at the university than, than they've been alive. And just, just as you said, Erica, it's all of those things. There's some people just arrive, I think it looks, they're quite intrigued by the course and they just want to pick up Reddit and do something a bit fun. And they don't know really who the Beatles are. And quite often by the end of the course, they're, they're completely obsessed. They're, they're complete nerds by the end of the course. I do get sometimes musicologists Classical musicians want to do the course as well. They want to look at the musicology. We get the fine art thing. They want to look at Peter Blake, Andy Warhol, the album covers, the whole cultural theory thing, you know, culture industry, Adorno, all of that stuff. 
I do get really serious. There's always there was two students today were just is were absolutely obsessed. They were super fans, just like us. But here, yeah, as I just said, they're they're all really young. I mean, what's that? Is that Gen Z? Yeah, Why is it something yeah. else now. Is that Alpha? We have yes, the Alpha. It, it could be actually. Yeah. Is that the next one? Yeah. Generation Alpha. Yeah. Oh my, we're starting over. Just like Love Me Do, and now and then we're going right back. Oh yeah, starting <sighs> over. My goodness. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's, I mean, since you've been doing this podcast, I mean, what, what sort of? Well, I mean, this is this is predicated fandom essentially. I mean, just look at all the people that you've interviewed. They're well, they're fans in some way or another, some form of another. I think. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I don't yeah. think you choose this this world unless you really want to get in the weeds. Yeah. And, you know, Richard, as we come up to here in America, we're very excited. You know, we're going to celebrate the 60th anniversary of the Beatles landing here and playing at Sullivan, which we're going to talk about on our next podcast, which is going to be great. How do you think the Beatles fandom is going to evolve in the next 60 years? That's the toughest question you've asked me. I think it good. I, yes, no, it's, really, it's a really good question. <laughs> I think, I, again, I was talking to a Beatles tribute band. They were Liverpoolians, and they were probably about in their 40s. They said that these Beatles songs are going to be around for hundreds of years, just the, the music, because it's folk music, so it will be there. So I don't think it's going away any time soon. I'm not sure how it will change, but it's obviously going to be you know, predicated in some sort of digital platforms. I mean, just look at the Beatles themselves now and then. You know, you've got older Paul and Ringo larking around with George and John in that in that new video that I think was Peter Jackson made. So mm. um, obviously technology is going to really, is really going to influence what happens in the future. But as I said, it's very, very hard to crystal ball because you could never predict the longevity of art. I mean, in the 1920s, the biggest selling novelist in the world was Edgar Rice Burroughs, who wrote the Tarzan books. He was like the J.K. Rowling of his day. And now if you go in the street and say, do you know who Edgar Rice Burroughs is? Nobody would know. So maybe in the 19th century as well, I'm sure we would have thought people would still be reading Dickens, but you just can't predict. My hunch tells me, my intuition tells me that the, the Beatles are here to stay and the Beatles fandom is here to stay. And it's going to morph change and transform into really unpredictable areas and again predicated on on cyberspace on the digital world that's the only um predictions that that i could that i could make yeah Mm. i agree though i personally draw the line at a hologram beatles concert i never want to see it yeah no Uh, thanks no uh, thanks oh yeah there's there's the abba concert yeah the hotel i must maybe i should see that i don't know have you been have you you seen that no I'm, i'm afraid that i'll never recover from the idea of seeing hologram people perform on stage. I don't know. There's something. Yeah, they do have Elvis don't they as well. They could, they oh, had Elvis no. and Roy Orbison. And Roy yeah. Orbison. Yeah. No, thanks. The Beatles is a tabula rasa where you're just a, a black sheet. You can read almost anything into it. That's what's so wonderful about it as well. As I say, the songs and the albums, the performances are there. They exist in perpetuity. But you know, we can read so much into the Beatles and voice so much onto them. So much of us. And I suppose reception theory as well. Everybody responds to a text, whether it's a book or a film or a song, depending on their gender, depending on their class, depending on their nationality. So we all translate it very differently as well. So it's not surprising that when different gender, different class, different people, different nationalities listen to this music, that when they engage with it or play it or write books about it, or write fan fiction about it or mash videos about it or do a Danger Mouse, Jay-Z mashup of it, that it's going to come out as something different because, you know, we, we all experience this culture in very, very different ways. So hurrah for multiplicity and hurrah for indeterminacy and for mixed spaces and mingling. I think it's a very plural and optimistic thing. I always think that, I always tell my Beatles class that my favourite Beatles lyric, it isn't great poetry, but it's really emotional and it's really important in 2024. And with within you, without you, George says the line, with our love, we can change the world. And for a brief period between 1967 and 1968, the Beatles really believed that. You know, when you open Sgt. Pepper, you see their four pairs of slightly dilated stoned eyes staring mm-hmm. out at their fans. And their intention was to send out good vibes into the world, man. And it's, it's just not, it's not a bad thing to have done with the Beatles, is to sort of 
still have this idea that, you know, love is pretty good. Amen. I don't know if it's love or it's just uh, their brilliance, but there's something about this fandom. We're not just consumers, we're creators. Yeah, that's such a good point. Also, I, I do, in my Beatles courses, while I do look at quite a lot of the, the grand narratives of history, big history that created the Beatles, that was another reason for this book. I mean, there's lots of big history beyond the Beatles that went into creating them. I mean, just think if description was abolished, they would have been sent off to the you know, declining years of the British Empire to somewhere if description hadn't just been mm. abolished. I mean, John and Ringo just just missed conscription. Yeah. Think about it, the, the Attlee Labour government in the 40s brought in the uh, National Health Service. The Beatles were healthy, they were well fed. The Butler Education Act of 1944 brought in grammar schools. If you pass the 11 plus, you get streamlined into the middle class. John, Paul and George were scholarship boys. They had access to a classical education. The consumer boom in the, the 50s, the white heat of technology, as the Labour Prime Minister Harold Wilson called it in the 1960s. So the micro histories, the little personal histories of the Beatles coalesces with the grand narratives, the great big sweep of history. It's just absolutely amazing. I mean, just look at the, my next book's the, Beatles and Black Music, and you think that Paul McCartney's father played Dixieland Jazz and Jim Mack's Jazz Band. Think of Liverpool's links with the slave trade as well. It's absolutely fascinating. I mean, for example, in 1861, the ship owners and the dock managers in Liverpool were actually, and I don't know if I want to say this on a recorded podcast, but there was a lot of fan, um, there was a lot of sympathy towards the Confederacy side in the, uh, in the 1860s. In, with the people that had money, the half and half knots in Liverpool. Of course, the working people, they would strike. You'd get free trade halls, matches to Liverpool. They didn't want to get with the manager, say, that sympathy with, um, you know, that sympathy with the, um, the union side and didn't appreciate it. were totally anti the Confederacy. But, you know, the way big history feeds into people's history and the fact that, as I said, that Paul's father was a cotton salesman, Liverpool's um, slave museum, all of this. So I think I always tell my students this in the class as well, that the sort of the personal history, the micro history of the Beatles just opens a window so much to classical music, experimental classical music in the 60s. It opens up the big sweep, the grand arts of history as well. So sorry, I went off on one a bit there. I have too much caffeine. No, I'm glad you did it. And in fact, you anticipated my last question, which is to tell us about your upcoming projects and where people who might want to follow your work can do so. The Beatles and fandom, which I've got so many good reviews about it. I think people just like it because it's it's really quite an eccentric, wacky book. Again, Mark Duffley wrote Understanding Fandom said in the IS um, the, the ISPM, um, International Association of Popular Music, he reviewed the book and said it's completely crazy, the Beatles and Fandom, but I couldn't stop reading it. And I do I th- it is a little bit whimsical and a little bit bonkers. That's one of the reasons I enjoyed writing it. It's a great book. Oh, thank you. It's it's available on Amazon. You can go to Bloomsbury and buy the paperback. Um, my next book's called Beatles and Black Music, Postcolonial Theory, Remix Culture and Musicology. So I'm going to take a really deep dive into the Beatles' connection to colonial and post-colonial history. I go from Lord Woodbine in the 1950s, because the Beatles used to play on Slater Street. They used to play Calypso with Lord Woodbine in the 1950s, and he's sort of been airbrushed a little bit out of Beatles history. So I go from... Lord Woodbine up Jay Z, and I even end up with Paul McCartney's last McCartney Three, his last album, where it was mashed by younger younger artists as well. And I have to say, the Beatles always did say that right back in their early interviews, they always said, "Look, we're absolutely obsessed with um, American um, black music." I mean, look at look at the Please Please Me album. We've got the Shirelles, the Cookies. They covered all these African American girl groups, the Three Way Harmony, all of that stuff. Arthur Alexander. Yes, Arthur Alexander, Anna, go to him, all of that stuff. It's going to be out um, in Bloomsbury at the end of 2024. So that's my next book on the Beatles. And then I'm going to surprise myself and everybody else by doing a biography of a movie star in 2025. But I'm not going to tell you on the podcast I'm going to write about. Ooh, really? Secret. Well, we'll have to have you on when the next book comes out and then maybe you'll divulge that. This has been wonderful. Thank you, Richard, for coming Absolutely. on the podcast. Yeah, what a brilliant podcast. What fun. Oh, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. I'm going to go home and I'm going to listen to the Beatles in bed under the duvet. <laughs> Sounds perfect. <Aww. laughs>
Sounds like a fiction. perfect night. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. Okay. With my Great. Torchlight. Have fun. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you so much, I guys. Love it. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Richard. Okay. Bye. Bye. <laughs> bye. Bye. So that was amazing. And thanks again to Richard. And thanks to you for listening to Because the Beatles. As always, subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever you're listening right now. And give us a rating slash review so other Beatle maniacs can find us. And follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter slash X, and TikTok. We'll be posting photos and more from this episode and beyond. And remember, you can always email us at bcthebeatles at gmail.com. See you next time. Bye. Bye.